Hi, welcome back to A Different Atheist Reads. Christy here, and we're going to continue on with A History of God by Karen Armstrong. And I'm going to be presenting my critique of the first section of her introduction, or chapter one of her book. Now, in previous videos, I've ranted, and I've also mentioned that I come from an academic background. And I realized in the last sort of rant that I did, and kind of leading up to preparing for this rant, that um, I'm not, I haven't done a good job of explaining to you guys sort of the basis for my critiques. So in chapter, this beginning part of chapter one, it seems like a good time to kind of use this because there's not too much in the way of content that's going to be important you know, later on in the book. And it might just be, now that we've gotten past the introduction and because Karen didn't do in the introduction what I expected her to do, I can explain to you guys, um, again, if I were going to do a peer review on this, where would I be coming from? So if you are a university student or you know a university student, then you might want to just flag up this video for yourself or for them for when you have to write an essay. Because what I want to talk about today is academic writing and how to write a professional academic piece of work, what I think goes into it. And then if I lay out my values and what I've been introduced to in terms of my training, and then uh, I will compare it with what Karen does in her book and show why I don't think it's a very direct way of, of writing a book and explaining yourself. And then the last thing I'm going to do is, in that section is give what I think are better alternative um, ways that Karen could have done her book. So um, again, very briefly, in this video, the first thing I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about what, how I would approach this if I were doing it for peer review. The next section is I'm going to apply those standards to what we've already seen Karen do in her book. And then the last thing is how I would have improved it if I would have been the reviewer on this book. So that's going to be the first part of this rant. And then the second part will, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about the problems I found in the introduction, the stuff from the last video and, and why I have a problem with it. But that's probably going to be quite short. The biggest part of this video is probably going to be the upfront ranting. I'm calling this episode, Here's the Thing. And it's because when I started to think about how I wanted to explain this to you, I, that was what first came to my mind, which was, okay, here's the thing. Um, when I go to do a piece of academic writing, my intention is to communicate clearly to my audience. By the way, if you are have ever been a student of mine, uh, this discussion might sound a little bit familiar. And if I take a tone, um, as if I'm a university lecturer telling you how to write an essay, please don't feel offended. It's just that's the tone that I take because this is the time I've given those kinds of speeches. So, um, you know, I'm going to put on my, I guess, I'm officially putting on my Dr. Christy Winters hat here, and you're getting a sort of a freebie glimpse of what it would be like to hear my lecture on how to write um, for academic writing in a university setting. So, why I find Karen really frustrating is the Biggest difference between academic writing and, say, a crime novel, crime novel is that we don't wait to the end of a piece of academic writing to find out how it turned out. Okay, so the point of an introduction and the point of, of what you do in your book is to lay out very clearly your arguments in the beginning and then demonstrate how the evidence supports your arguments as you move through either the article or the book chapter or the book. And um, I want to use a heuristic, uh, basically it's four questions that you can ask yourself about a piece of writing to determine whether or not you are understanding it correctly or if it's very well written. And those four questions are, what is my question? What is my answer? Why should you believe me? And why should you care? Now on the first question, what is my question, this is basically what your book is about. Your book presumably is set out to answer a question that either people have or you pose and give to people and then provide them the answer. So it's very important to understand what question your book is addressing. The next thing is, what is your answer? And this again is not something that you wait until your conclusion chapter to set up, right? Because if you think about it, a piece of academic writing is like a journey. You are asking people to follow your directions to reach a specific destination. And imagine that you were given a set of directions from Google Maps that has your starting place and your ending place. And at every point along the way, you know exactly where you are and how you are using that information to get to your destination. 
That's what a book is. It's a, a conceptual roadmap where you want to show people where they're going to end up and explain how you're going to get them there and then you take them there through chapter by chapter. Right, so you need to know the answer to the question, what is my question, um, in order to provide that roadmap. And if you don't provide a roadmap, then nobody, when people read your book and they read something, they won't know if it's important because they don't know if it really ties to the question or if it's just a tangent or if it's sort of an extra piece of information that was provided for context or fun. If you don't understand where you're going, you can't distinguish between what is important in your writing, in, in the article or the book, and what isn't. And that's why, as an author, it's your job to indicate this is really important, pay attention, this is going to be, this is going to come up later. Or, this isn't important, but if you want to understand the context, I'm just going to explain a bit more. Um, these are very important things to do. You have a responsibility, I think, as an author to do those things. So, what is my question? What is my answer? Why should you believe me? This is a, something that Karen doesn't really address in her book in terms of what methods or methodology or evidence or procedures is she going to be using to demonstrate her uh, history of God. And then the last question is, why should we care? This is a pretty important question because if you don't give, a, don't give people a reason for reading your book and caring about the answer, they're not necessarily going to stick with it. So. Why should you, what is your question? What is your answer? Why should you believe me? And, um, you know, why should we believe you, I guess? And why should we care? Now, in terms of what, I'm just consulting my notes here. In terms of what I've, I have tried actually to do a fair and charitable interpretation of what I think Karen is trying to communicate. The problem is that it's not particularly clear because she doesn't really state these things clearly. But in terms of her question, what I think her book is about, is what are the ways in which people have constructed God over time? That, that seems to be the question. Um, and her answer, I think, would be in many ways. Uh, why should we believe her? As I said, that's not a particularly well-addressed question in terms of her introduction or even her introductory chapter or chapter one her explaining really where is she getting her information and on the basis that she's making her evaluations and her conclusions. That's not really very well laid out. And why should we care? The why should we care, care question, I think there is a very fuzzy answer to that. And I feel like in some ways I'm having to force this extraction of this information to answer these four questions because Karen doesn't do it for us. But to be, again, to be charitable, I think in terms of why we should care, her argument would be human beings are spiritual beings. Uh, we all do this anyway, but in our modern day, we have science and science is um, has created a distance between us and our ancient past and so we're going to use this book to look backwards to see what people believed before science. If, if you disagree, please write something else in the comments, but I, from what I've read, that seems to be a fair um, interpretation of her intentions. If I were doing a peer review on this book, I would have a lot to say. <laughs> but um, I would basically counter uh, what I've identified as her four questions with four what I think are better questions when I've now read her, you know, her stuff quite in depth, at least in the first, the stuff that we've covered, because of course I have to read it again and again to try to figure out what, what it's about and how it connects to things and where she's going with this. And that's, I guess, why I get really pissed off with this book is because I'm doing the work that she should have been doing from the start. Um, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be my job to figure out what her question is or what her answer is or why I should believe her. And this, I guess, is where I get very frustrated with Karen because it's, it's not that she's not a good writer. She writes very beautifully. She's just not very rigorous. She has no substance underneath her beautiful words. And so I think it would have been far better as a book, far more interesting, relevant, and engaging probably if the question that she would have asked would have been something like this. Can modern people learn something from the meaning that ancient peoples found in their construction of God? Yes or no? And if yes, which presumably she would say it is, what is it? Because this gets to the problem with the why should we care? Why should we care what people in ancient times thought about God? 
her point in that introduction when she set it up was to say that in the modern age we are disconnected from the unseen that existed before the scientific revolution. Well, if that's the case, if we live now and we have for the last, let's say, going on two centuries and, and going forward in a world that's increasingly um, removed from a concept of the unseen, how does it really help us to go back and learn what ancient people 3,000 years or 2,000 years or even 1,000 years thought about those things? How is that relevant to us? And I think the problem that I guess I'm really having now with the book is Karen seems to think that the answer to our problems today is to look back to the past. Well, my problem with that is the past is gone. So isn't it her responsibility really to demonstrate how the past is relevant to us today in our modern times? That the burden shouldn't be on us to go try to fit our mindset back into an ancient mindset from which we've been forever removed, but rather what can she do with her comparative religious background to extract meanings that are common both in ancient people's value systems and our modern value pe modern people's value systems and bridge that. That to be, I think, would have been a far more interesting book to read. So that would have been, if I were her, <laughs> of course at that point she would have written the book so she probably wouldn't have been very happy with my review, but if she and I had coffee, that is the question I would pose to her and put that burden not on us, uh, we as the readers, to conform our views to something in, in the ancient world, but rather for her as a comparative religious specialist to make her understanding of those meanings significant to us today. Um, in terms of an answer, obviously I'm not going to give an answer because it's a hypothetical question and I haven't done the research. And in terms of why we should believe her, I think that, you know, she should have done a, a little bit of work in terms of researching values and meaning in modern society and then tie those to writings and beliefs or whatever else back in ancient writings. So um, I don't have a, a good, an I would have had a better answer to the why should I believe you question if, if it was posed to me from this book. I would have wanted something a bit more robust than citing a guy who was primarily a linguist, um, Wilhelm Schmidt, um, in his speculation that perhaps monotheism preceded polytheism. Like, well, what the hell does that have to do with anything? Nothing. So why is it in your book? You know, it, it, she doesn't really cite credible sources and that's another problem that I have with her book. Okay, so um, I think that gives you a little bit of a perspective as to why I find Karen a bit fuzzy and gooey and soft and with no mass, so no center, no nothing I can grip on. I always feel like I'm tripping forward in her book. I'm not being guided. I feel like I'm stumbling through rather than being clearly led from argument to argument. But. Um, now moving back to the book, the introduction to chapter 01, oh god, I just read those first few pages thinking, okay, okay, I read the first few pages thinking they were going to go somewhere, this whole, the monotheism preceding polytheism thingy, um, but no, that just fizzles out, and it, as I pointed out in the video, if you have an account of something that happened in history and you have no idea whether, you have no way to prove it one way or the other. Again, this notion that polytheism preceding, uh, sorry, monotheism preceding polytheism um, and then polytheism becoming monotheism again. There's just no evidence. I did a quick Wikipedia search on Father Wilhelm Schmidt. He was an anthropologist, a linguist, and ethnologist or something like that, but he was, his passion was linguistics. And then he spent all these decades writing his book in the early part of the 20th century. I don't see that in that entry that he was influential, that he was cited by other people, that there have been discoveries that confirm his stuff. He basically just seemed to be a guy with an opinion. Why would you make that the first line of your book? Uh, seriously, I mean, this guy, as far as I can see, is contributed nothing um, scholarly to the idea. So I just was, again, as a, as a from like a peer review point of view, I would have just chalked out, I would have written, rewritten that whole first section and got rid of this empty speculation that has nothing to do with anything and really focused on um, putting the reader, if her focus wanted to be, uh, her focus was uh, intended to be this distinction between science and the modern uh, age and the way that people existed in the past, start with that. Just, you know, even put that in the introduction. 
say that in the introduction, you know, that you want to connect the ancient um, life and ancient meaning to modern life and, and modern meaning. It would have been so much clearer. And so I just, I don't really understand what the point of that introduction is. Um, and, and it doesn't really seem to set us up in a good way to move into Mesopotamia. I think that that first section really should have been in the introduction. And, her, and taken out her autobiography and talked about modern life and the connections with the past and how that could be a personal exploration or something. But that was just like... Um, and the other thing, of course, I wanted to complain about was her assertion that people had very specific beliefs about myths and she is certain that they took them figuratively, not literally, and that they saw them as stories, not as scientific explanations. And it just... I'm dumbfounded because these ideas in terms of how the world works and functions the idea of something being a scientific account or an explanatory account versus a mythological account or some kind of socially constructed and meaningful account that does isn't intended to depict reality those are distinctions we make um, those are distinctions that we have as a consequence of science. So uh, I don't know, again, how she can, can know these things when I don't even th think that she has a linguistic basis for the concept of abstractions. Now, here I'm going to mention something that um, if you've watched my video on Eve, then you'll maybe remember I had the mechanical translation of the Bible, which is an attempt by somebody here on YouTube who seems to be sort of a self-taught um, expert on Hebrew and Hebrew language, and in particular ancient Hebrew. But his approach to dealing with the text of Genesis and Exodus and the first five books um, of the Jewish writings is to create, a, to really do a literal translation from ancient Hebrew into modern English. Not to make it go through sort of the middle Hebrew and then the Greek and then the English, but to try to do a direct translation from ancient Hebrew to English. And what was fascinating to me when I watched what he was doing and I, I looked at his translations was to realize that the ancient Hebrew language does not have a concept for abstractions. Everything is, let's say call it figurative, but it's written in a very descriptive way. So what's the difference between an abstraction and something concrete? That's the good distinction. Think about ancient Hebrew as being a language where everything has to be concrete, some kind of connection to a physical thing. Um, let's do a good comparison right from my Eve video. The notion of good is an abstraction because good is a quality of a thing um, that can be extracted out of it and then universalized to a, a series of, of other things. It's, it's, it's not a direct relationship of a characteristic of the thing. But if we look at the ancient Hebrew in the story of Adam and Eve and, and the tree uh, and the knowledge, in English it's translated as knowledge of good and evil. But if you use the ancient Hebrew, it's knowledge of function and dysfunction. So he's using the word function consistently throughout the Hebrew text to mean a certain kind of thing. And here it means doing what is in, it is intended to do. So if you build, if you write code, and you write code to perform a certain task, and you run the code, and the code performs the task, it's a good little code, it functions, right? Oh, well done, you code, you did what you were supposed to do. That is functioning. When you dysfunction, it's the disappointment of not doing what you were meant to do. It's when you write a piece of code and then you realize that it's got a bug in it and you're like, ah, oh, this thing doesn't work. It dysfunctions. The ancient Hebrew in the mechanical translation that I was using uses those concepts. They don't use, it does not use good and evil because good and evil is too abstract. But a thing can function well and properly, or a thing cannot function well and improperly, and those are the words that are actually used in the text. So in light of this, I don't know how Armstrong can make claims about what people who existed before the ancient Hebrews came up with their language were thinking about abstractions and concretes. And this notion of, um, I think the Hebrew language eventually does pick up con uh, the abstract concepts, but they get it from the Greeks. It doesn't come from sort of the native language itself. It's an imported cultural influence from Hellenization of that time period in, in, in that geography. So again, um, I just don't see any scholarship behind a lot of these claims. And every time I see something that I think is bullshit, 
it just makes me trust her less and less. And it's really disappointing because, as I said, I, I enjoyed the book a lot and it meant a lot to me when I read it. Unfortunately, coming back to it now, it's looking less and less credible as an historical or a evidence-based account. And it really looks more like fiction. Not invented and not lies, but again, I would almost call it the mythology of Karen Armstrong, not a history of God. And the farther I go in the book, and, and let's face it, we're, we're only into the first chapter, the, the stronger my impression is. Now, maybe things will get better later on, fingers crossed, who knows, it could work. Um, but moving forward, if you want to know like what I'm looking for in the text, what questions I'm asking when I read through the chapters, what evidence uh, I'm looking for to convince me, and, and these kinds of things, that's where I'm coming from. And basically, I'm asking, is she doing a good job on these four points? At any point, you know, am I clear about where we're going? Am I clear about the relevance of what this chapter is, how it fits into the larger narrative, and how it answers the four questions that I, I set up? So, I wasn't, this is pretty academic-y, I know, and, and maybe not what you were expecting on a Thursday night or whenever you're watching this, but I feel that if I make references now back to these values and back to this perspective, it, you'll know that I'm, I'm ranting from a specific normative position and I'm not just ranting for the sake of ranting. I actually do have things, you know, and I've explained them to you now and maybe now you too will care about them and when you go to a book, if you pick something up off your shelf by a scholar or, you know, one of these popular books, just ask, well, what is the author's question? Why should I believe her? Why should, I'm sorry, what is her question? What is her answer? Why should I believe her? And why should I care? And if it doesn't answer those questions, well, then you know it doesn't answer those questions, you might have to be on the lookout for it, or you just might want to, you know, kind of question the level of writing of the person and doing the book. Maybe they've written something more recently and they've gotten better. I hope Karen has gotten better. This book is pretty old, so in some ways I feel unfair smashing it apart, but on the other hand, it was a New York Times bestseller, and if you're going to have people pay for your book, oh my gosh, I couldn't have put this book out. Okay, so I'm going to wrap it up here. That's going to be it for uh, this episode of Here's the Thing, uh, Rant 2 on a Different Atheist Reads. Next time we're going to be moving into monotheism and the text, the first few books of the Torah. I will again present Karen's perspective and I'm already presenting a really nice, I'm uh, preparing a really nice critique of her um, claims and I guess this is just going to how it goes. So if you're enjoying it, I'm enjoying it, and thank you for watching, thank you for subscribing, and I'll see you next week Thursday. Bye.